Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the May Rider Clinic, um, which we've been really excited for this um, clinic to come along because, as you know, um, you guys that have been following the page and are regular clinic um, attendees, um, we are very lucky to be joined by um, Race Safe for this clinic. Um, as always, I'm just going to check the tech, guys, so I'm just going to check that we are actually live. So I will have a look in my, if anybody's there, if they could just pop a comment on so that I know that we're streaming okay, that would be really helpful. But I'm pretty sure that we are off. Yeah, I think we're off and we're going, so that's grand. Thanks very much, Ria. Thanks very much, Fish. That's amazing. Um, just a quick warning, as the guys have attended clinic before, occasionally we get visitors from abroad that pop links into the comments um, to try and drive you away from the page. So if you just ignore them, that would be absolutely fabulous. Um, I will block um, as I can throughout the clinic. But yeah, just ignore them, please. That'd be grand. Thank you, everybody. It's lovely to see you all here again for another amazing clinic. Um, for you guys that haven't met me before, my name's Dr. Diane Fisher, um, and I am all the King's Horses. I'm also the Chief Medical Officer for BETA. Um, and as you guys know that have been following me for a while, I'm on a bit of a mission to make our sport as safe as possible. Um, so we run these clinics every month um, just to give you a bit more information about some of the injuries that are common in equestrian just really so that you know what you can do to either prevent them or what you can do if they happen. We're not here to scare you, we're just here to educate you so that if the worst happens that you're in a better position to deal with things. So as I've alluded to, we are incredibly lucky to be joined by James Howe from Race Safe. So I am just gonna bring him in. Um, let me just bring him into the stream. Hi, James. Hi, Diane. Hi, thank you so much um, for coming to the clinic. No, it's a pleasure. And thank, thank you. For having us. <laughs> no, honestly, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, I have here my very trusty race safe, which I use myself um, and have done for the whole of my riding career. Um, now, the the clinic today is going to touch on quite a few things, um, and. As you know, one of the biggest things that you've done, which I think everybody is aware of, you have very generously donated um, a body protector and cover for one of our lucky viewers and followers to, um, to receive for supporting the clinic. And we massively appreciate that. That's really, really kind. Thank you very, very much. So as we've chatted about before, um, the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to touch a little bit on the anatomy of the thorax, just so that people understand all the work that you do and, and what it's what it's protecting really because we all know we've got bits and pieces inside us but it's just a little bit easier um if we run through it first so that everything makes sense so guys you've got to bear with me a little bit today because i've got props and props props can go wrong let's be honest so prop number one is this now she may or may not like it well she has been desensitized to it but this is prop number one can you see that okay james you'll have to be my uh, yes yeah. we can see we can see okay what do you think do you like it um so what we're going to do is we're just going to work through a little bit about what the actual thorax is leave it alone so we talk about in medicine we talk about the anterior chest wall which is um this part of your of your body so you have this flat bone here, which is called the sternum, and you can feel your own because that's the bit where you put the heel of your hand if you happen to do CPR. Um, but it's actually quite long when you look at it in the um, hello, in the um, skeleton, and you can feel the end of it if you sort of stick your fingers up where your um, ribs join. You can feel this little point of it, which is called the zippy sternum. On the front, obviously, you've got the front of the ribs, and um, what's quite interesting and a lot of people don't realise is that this part of the ribs not the whole rib is not bone so i have got um some ribs from my skeleton that i inherited from my father so as the ribs go down they get thinner so this is probably a 12th rib because i don't know if you can see it's quite thin and if i if i did do that it would snap quite easily whereas when you look at some of them further up you can see that these ribs up here are a lot stronger and a lot thicker 
There's a teeny weeny one up here at the top, which as medics we're incredibly interested in, and this is um, rib one. So to break this one, which sits here underneath the clavicles, you have to have an enormous amount of force. So if we are suspecting an injury here, we are very, very worried about what else is going on inside the thoracic cage. Sat on top at the front. Hello, you've been very good. Sat on top of the front here is you have your clavicles or your collarbones, um, and they run from the sternum across to the shoulder, which again, you can feel the pointy out bits. And they actually attach, they don't attach to the actual, the, what, the arm bone. What they attach to is the scapula. So they attach to this bone that sits in your, in your back here. Now I do have Martha's scapula. So you can see there, that's the scapula, and you can see this little joint here that may or may not be the right clavicle. So I'll just have a quick peek. It's not quite right because it's the wrong-sided clavicle, but essentially that sits and, and joins up with that one. So as we go on to talk about later when we talk about the protectors, there is a reason why you'd be looking to actually protect this area. So that's kind of the front. The things that we do need to think about at the front as well is this rib cage comes down quite low. And if you feel on yourself and go along, hello, your tummy button is only there. So that's halfway down your abdominal cavity. So if you think you're coming down to here, your diaphragm sits around here. You've got almost half of the abdominal cavity that's covered by this thoracic cage, which again is very important in the protection that body protectors give us. Now up on the right hand side, you have the liver and that sits cradled right underneath here. Part of a lobe of the liver, this side will stick out slightly and come to about there, but unless you've got um, a pathological reason, so unless you've got something wrong with you, which means your liver is bigger, you should only really get a little nugget of it really sticking out there one edge the rest of it is it's pretty big human ones about that size and it's it's tucked up in here so it's really well protected by the thoracic cage you've got two kidneys obviously both of those are both again up underneath here and particularly on this hand at this side on the left hand side of the chest you have an organ called the spleen, um, which is involved in immune function and filtering all of your blood. And that sits up there as well. Now that has a massive blood supply. The liver has a massive blood supply. So you can get torrential and catastrophic bleeding from these two areas, including kidneys as well. Careful. Tummy and stomach. So stomach is sat up here. And then there is a gland just behind here called the pancreas, which we do rarely see injured in equestrian trauma but I have seen it a couple of times where the gland has been damaged here from a force that's come in and actually got through where, where the body protector would, would lie. But the injuries to the organs here were okay. So that person actually did very well. So then if we turn it around, do you want to look at her face there? Yes. So if we turn it around, then you can see the posterior, so the back um, of the skeleton so these are the shoulder blades these are the um, scapula that we talked about you have to remember in medicine we have like a clever word for everything it's not that clever it's just so we think we are um, and you can see that you've got ribs all the way down again and they do go down quite far so if you feel the back of your rib cage you're down here so you're not that far off your bum to be honest so you are covering an enormous amount of the abdominal cavity at the back Obviously, we all know about the, the spine and how important it is to try and um, protect the spine. Be careful because she's spiky. Um, and you can see here, so this obviously is running the full length. You've got the full spine here. You're starting off at C1 to 7, and there's 12 vertebrae in the back. So if we count down, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. But it's actually really easy to find the first vertebrae because if you feel at the back of your neck, you'll feel there's a big bubble. And that is the end of this bone, which is C7. So then it's really easy to know that the next bubble that you feel coming down is T1. And we can go down to T12. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And as you can see, it corresponds with the 12th rib. It isn't attached to the 12th rib, but it, 
it goes actually at that level when you actually take a essentially a sagittal plane across okay so you get quite a lot of protection from from there so that's kind of the anatomy of it um and that gives you just a bit more understanding about what's in there um, and then obviously because i've forgotten them you've got your heart and lungs haven't you <laughs> um so you obviously got a pair of lungs in there and a great big beating heart and three big pipes so three big pipes that we worry about one that brings the blood up from the bottom of the body back up to the heart so the vena cava the aorta which is the big vessel that runs down and supplies all the blood to everywhere from the heart and then we have something called the thoracic duct as well which is another big pipe that covers all of your lymphatic so that's the kind of, it's essentially a bit of a juice, which is full of white blood cells and immune stuff that kind of flows around. And if you, you know, when at school, you kind of saw the pictures of the blood supply, you can see that for veins, arteries, and for lymph. So it's the same. There's like three different systems that go through. Issues with those are is that they are tethered um, at the back of the um, thoracic wall. Let me just show you, because it's quite important in rotation and in deceleration injury. So if you think there will be a layer of fascia here, then your aorta is, is tethered to the back in places here. So therefore, if you have an injury that kind of you do this with really quickly, you can tear... Um, the vessels that are running along the back so that's just a bit of a whistle top um whistle top um tour really um but i'd like to invite james now really to talk to us about about body protectors and about how they've kind of come about where they are now um and how on earth did you end up getting involved in body protection uh, th yeah thanks dan that was, that was right. interesting um, well, yeah, as, as, as you uh, as you said, uh, I'm James Howe from Raise Safe. Um, we are a British brand that specialises in body protectors. Um, we sell to riders ar around the world, from pony club kids to champion jockeys and, and, and five star eventers. Um, we were established over fifty years ago now uh, by my grandfather. Um, oh wow! I didn't realise it was like a family business. That's yeah, cool. yeah, and uh, you know we, we continue to make body techs about twenty minutes away from our from our original factory. So no way, that's cool. That's yeah. cool. So we're sort of three generations deep. Um, you know, obviously, sort of technology has quite drastically changed since then. But um, you know, the aim of making sort of the safest and lightest and, and most comfortable protection is is, is pretty much unchanged. Um, you know, I think the the purpose of body protectors has is, is, is always really been to sort of absorb impact energy. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and we use different foam compounds and densities um, to do this and balance other qualities like, you know, weight and flexibility. Um, you know, and I think we have some unique design features that um, that we use uh, um, to, to try and achieve different different levels. But um, that's 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 what we're trying to do. Okay, and when you start, when you started off, so when your grandfather started off, James, what sort of thing did like? What do you know? What the prompt was for them to like? Was he a jockey or? Uh, it started off in race, yeah. It, you know, um, back then, not the very start, but quite early on, they were essentially sort of strapping polystyrene sheets to them with a with a big rubber band. No uh, way. Front and back, and I think I think Claire at Beat has probably still got a couple of those knocking around um which which she shows off now again um so yes obviously quite quite drastically different but but the the premise and, and, and the intention is, is pretty much unchanged really yeah it's, men it's mental isn't it so uh, how um where did it come like because initially i think when i first learned to ride maybe when i was little not that i want to admit how old i am i'm not sure i had a body protector i think i had a hat my parents are quite safety conscious, to be fair. When when did they be sort of cross over from? Like, I'm assuming they've crossed over from racing. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. think that some of the, some of the early models were worn um, in in sort of other disciplines uh, and for sort of leisure riding as well. Um, 
and this yeah there's there's still some comical images of of what, of what they look like um but yeah i think over the sort of last 20 30 years you know they became sort of established um you know i think so obviously they have changed and, and hopefully um attitudes towards them are changing as, as well yeah. i think um yeah. i think that's partly because there's now sort of a generation growing up who are used to wearing them you know yeah. from 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 starting riding um but also i think you know product designs played a, a big part of that as well you know they're, they're no longer sort of the perceived straight jackets stiff straight jackets yeah. that they perhaps were so you know i think that's that's made them more comfortable and, and more appealing to wear in more circumstances no definitely and so do you have a kind of like team of designers how do you kind of like if you were if you were like going to make or, or develop your product like what what kind of team do you have around you for that yeah so i think you know i think that's one of the biggest parts or benefits we say of of we make everything here in our factory in northamptonshire oh cool um which you know is great for sort of the quality of of product we put out but i think almost as important is the ability it gives us to sort of develop products and, and constantly sort of innovate really um we've got a we've got a sort of a design team here of sort of three people um and we sort of we you know the window is onto the factory floor really so it's a constant oh, cool. so you can see them. them so yeah, there's no messing around when you're in your office then sorry so there's no messing around when you're in the office then uh well no unfortunately <laughs> they don't they don't go much quicker which is oh, um, well. You need to work you know, on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're we're getting shouted at for you know um, people wanting their body sectors to go out and ride in the summer, but unfortunately that doesn't quite translate to them them going quicker. No. And have you been affected by when you're saying for this summer? Have you been affected by COVID? Then have you had an impact? Um, yeah, I mean, it's been are, a, they hand, a, are they handmade then? Yeah, yeah, pretty. No yes, way. they are. Um, no way. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I think particularly the the design we use, which is, um, you know, they're each comprised of sort of individual segments of, of foam, um, which is sort of all individually hinged, which, you know, which gives it sort of flexibility and comfort side. But the downside to that, obviously, being that each of those has to be individually inserted and, and secured, etc. So, you know, most of the jackets have sort of over 100 um, segments in. So it's a constant process of securing and, and inserting those. So yeah it is it is very labor intensive um and i think manufacturing and well for the last 12 months it's, it's been um tricky shall we say yeah um, what's it been, is what's it been tricky with getting getting materials or yeah everything yeah i think you know getting getting raw materials um you know trying to trying to keep sort of um a, a consistent team of people as well yeah, yeah. Um, it's been pretty tricky um you know i think um you know part of part of manufacturing in britain is that it's all there is always a shortage of sort of the skills we need really yeah we're um, really good at making things though aren't we we always were like really yeah. really good at making things and then yeah. not that being political but we seem to like stop and become a bit of a service industry but mm. i think actually our country was always good at making stuff yeah it's so generally it's yeah, it is, it is, to know yeah. that you still make it and it's still handmade in britain mm. that's yeah it's, that's a, it's a generation thing i think really you know i think it's not you know sewing and and, and manu you know and those sort of manufacturing skills just aren't really taught um or learnt anymore um which is you know which is a shame um you know so some of our machinists and some of our seamstresses and uh, have been with us sort of 30 odd years um so it's, it, it is you know we're trying to feed through that next generation as, as much as we can but it's but it's yeah it's certainly difficult but um you know we've 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 built the business off the back of being british made and um you know which comes with all the benefits we yeah. discussed so i don't think that's going to change but um, it, it certainly doesn't make life life easy. No, no, I bet. No, I bet it, it doesn't make it easier at all. And so, like, when you, what is the actual, so obviously I've got mine here, it's a bit dusty, sorry, but, and like you said about all the segments and stuff, because I, when I bought mine, I was shocked at how comfortable it is, and it kind of, it warms up, doesn't it? It warms up, and it just, it kind of just moulds to you, and you yeah, really... Yeah, it, it, it does, it does warm up. But, um, you know, I, I think that's, 
I think what we're trying to do is, is make a comfortable body detector from as soon as you put it on, really. And I, I always think it's a bit of a cop out when people say, oh, don't worry, you know, it, it, it'll warm up and, and, and get more comfortable when, you know, it's all very well. But no, but I think with this, with all the little, like, I don't know if anyone's like seen one before, but with all the little segments that you've got, like it does just, it just does fit. And I think when I went to buy a body protector, and a lot of people are commenting about the original, like when they've had them in the past where they had to have a bit between their legs. And I mean, I can't right. even imagine yeah, that. They, that yeah. Bloody nightmare. Yeah, it's but, a while ago. Yeah. yeah, but it's like, they're not like that anymore. And I think people need to understand the amount of work that manufacturers have done to make sure that they are easy to wear. They're not going to throw you off balance. And really, it's yeah, just I mean, like that's, a second That's skin. our job, really, is to try and make them as attractive you know or, or certainly as appealing to wear um as possible really you know it's no point making something that's uncomfortable and heavy and sweaty and, and stiff and then telling people that they should be wearing it every day you know um that's happen, that's just not going to happen so uh yeah you know that that's that's what we're trying to do you know i think we want to make you know i think body tech to design is that constant um balancing act between um levels of protection um and impact performance but also making them you know but not sacrificing sort of movement and and, and freedom while you're wearing it and, and comfort really um and that's that that is that constant you know body deck to design also really, you could, kind of balance the whole time isn't yeah it? you know you we could make them like turn you into sort of the michelin man really um yeah. but nobody's gonna be able to, you know that's that's but that's the, this, there's also the other safety side of it of actually well if you're restricting people's movement whilst they're riding, you know, is that more unsafe than a certain level of, of protection or not? So yeah, it is, yes, it's it? a balancing act, yeah. Yeah, difficult. And what is the actual materials that you use then? What What is that made out of? Like, um, Well, all sort of the, um, the impact segments are, are sort of different densities and compounds of foam. Um, okay. And we, you know, we, we blend those for different, um, I mean, don't qualities. tell me if it's like Coca Cola. Like, you don't need to say if it's like a recipe. You don't have to say like we are a like... bit unique. So, you know, it's but, like... it, so, but it's foam, like different. Yeah, yeah, it's closed cell foam. foam. Yeah, um, you know, and so you know, we 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 use different compounds and different densities depending on what we're trying to get out of that model. You know, whether it's a priority of um, weight or uh, breathability or or pure impact performance. Um, you know, we have lots of different sort of combinations that that um that try and try and meet a, a a sweet spot really you know whether that's there's different demands you know on different models so you know within the racing industry for example there's it's everything's about weight you know yeah. and, and um a, a meeting a target there um which isn't such an issue in sort of other disciplines um but you know for some but we just want to make us comfortable and as flexible as possible um you know and, and within the within the, the safety standards there's three levels of of um of performance of of protection so it depends what sort of model we're in for different uses and um uh and, and what model we're targeting at those and is it like so say like say your blend or whatever like you know your coca-cola bit whatever but like do you have like does that alter depending on where it's covering or is it that it's that foam and that's used throughout the whole body protector or do yeah. you uh, yeah, the part of, area? yeah no part of the testing is that it has to have sort of consistent um impact performance over the whole coverage um so it's not it's not specific to certain areas of um of your body um there might be an argument to say that probably should be the case you know you know certain sort of um uh, weak or, or or vulnerable areas um but yeah no part of the safety standards it has to have um you know and what to me but saying that you know when when we do the impact testing um what they'll quite a lot of that testing impact testing will be focused around what they sort of perceive as weak areas in it so whether it's the zip or or places like that so um the weakest areas of the body set to have to have to certainly meet or you know or exceed really the the required sort of impact performance and then probably the rest of the garment um you know has has a far greater level of, of protection but uh, we, we, what we don't want to do is, is leave any weak areas or, or, or vulnerable no 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 of course 
And and like you mentioned that about like testing of impact testing and stuff. What sort of things do you do to test like a body protector? Um, so I, what we're trying to do with the, with the different types of impacts they do at test houses. They're all registered test houses in the UK, and um, they'll basically they'll, they'll, they'll use different types of impacts to replicate different types of falls. Um, so they'll okay. they'll use very sort of localized um, concentrated impacts. Um, to sort of replicate falling onto a, a fence, um, a rail, being kicked, something like that. Okay. Um, and you know, but the other end of the scale, they'll do sort of very wider impacts um, over sort of a more dispersed area, you know, which are obviously trying to recreate falling onto flat ground and things like that. And uh, um, a big part of body tech design is, is trying to balance the the performance across those different types of impacts. You know, it, it's quite easy to make them perform very well in one type of fall, but to try and so sort of offer a more um, a wider scope of protection, that's 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 the that's the key. So it's similar to the stuff that we kind of saw with the hats there, that you are yeah. actually doing like blunt, essentially you're following the injury patterns, aren't you? Because you're yeah, doing exactly, like yeah. a blunt, a, a, like a, a, a crush. Do you have crush as well? No, don't, no, no. Right. Um, obviously that's, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure we could touch on sort of limitations of body yeah. but that's obviously uh, those crushing falls. Yes, we can sort of it, um, help but absorb. But you're still going to get the direct impact, impact aren't you? So you're still going to yeah, get you absorb that initial impact. But actually, the weight, the crushing effect is um, is is something that body techs aren't really designed to do. There was, you know, there were a few, there have been models in the past that tried to do that with sort of a a cage scenario. Um, what like a metal cage type thing? Yeah. Christ, yeah. See, that would be heavy, wouldn't it? You'd be like a medieval knight. Well, that's it. Uh, you know, it's all these things have have downsides, and, and that yeah. never really, um, never really uh, became established. Um, but yeah, so uh, you know, as with the hats, we're trying to replicate real world scenarios in sort of a laboratory, um, you know, testing. No, that's it's it's fascinating because you don't realise, I think, when you when you're like the, the the end user i guess like unless you kind of like watch something like this or whatever like you're aware that you need to but you have no idea at like the amount of actual it's science that's going in and right. engineering that's going yeah, in i suppose if you if you didn't background. if you didn't know much but you it would be the same of buying a, a coat or or something at your local salary yeah, yeah. you know you're picking it on you know aesthetic or something like that but you know yeah. they are all uh, certified safety products um so Something that somebody should look. I know you're saying like they've they've all got um, the standards and all certification. Like, is there something that we should look for? So, if we're going to buy a body protector, yeah, what, what is the kind of maximum um, that we can go for, or what? Yeah, would you well, I, I think sort of. So, yeah, within the standard, there's there's three levels of protection. Um, three being the highest, um, but really that's that's the level of protection that's suitable and recommended and, and required in, in most circumstances um for, for most types of riding um the, the lower levels are quite sort of specific uses whether that's racing or something like that so level okay. three so they're, be, not, they're not for us guys so we go no, and, and you won't see you won't really see anything other than a level three biosector in most uh tax tax shops or salaries it's only really sort of specialist shops who will probably uh, stock those other models so level three is you know you want that maximum level of protection um you also want something that's to the latest 2018 standard okay that's so that's awesome. the last standard is it 2018 yeah um the, the, you might there's people still with probably 2009 body protectors and that's absolutely fine that's probably that's still allowed in in all forms of sort of competition to run alongside the 2018 one um but it but it, it is quite important because you get an idea of the age of it you know and i think we Along with, I think uh, uh, most of the brands sort of recommend they're replaced every three to five years, you know, because you will get a gradual degradation of the foam. And so, after five years, we can't really guarantee the the impact performance, um, you know, and, and therefore the protection you're getting. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing is it, important thing is is we're, we're part of it, and most of the other major manufacturers are part of the beta scheme. Um, so you'll you'll see a beta label in them. Okay. Um, and that's really that's really become the industry standard. So while they are certified to sort of European standards, most people are more aware of the beta standards. So you want a beta level three body detector. And part of that beta scheme is that 
um, to be part of it. You have to test everything annually, which I think is very okay. important. And yeah. actually, and there has to be tests in sort of um, one of the designated test houses. Okay, so you can't slip through a dodgy one through the net then? No, well, it's, you know, it acts as a very good sort of quality assurance scheme, yeah. really, um, which other countries do recognise the beta scheme, but probably not quite as widely. Um, and that's perhaps what allows uh, lesser quality items, should we yeah. say, into, into the market. You know, cause just, just to clarify on that point, James, like if it's not, if it's not a beta stand level three, then that... My understanding is, but correct me if you're wrong, you, that product could have been tested with all the tests, but then it may never be tested again. Like that, that design will never be tested again. But with the ones that have the level three, every single year as manufacturers, you have to send X amount of product to a nominated test place. Yep. They independently test your quality yep. and whether you're still achieving the results. If you're not, they'll withdraw the standard. Would, is that what they're yeah, doing? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's yeah, a, that's a big yeah. safety. That's a big safety net, isn't it? Yeah, it's been a brilliant. It's, it's, it's a it's a great initiative by Beta, and I think um, it's probably one of the main things they're known for. Really, you know, they they do a lot of other work behind the scenes, but you know, their body set to standard um, is is probably something that most people know them for. Um, yeah, that's huge. That's huge, huge. isn't it? Oh, it's yeah, super yeah. interesting. Yeah. Super interesting. So what we might do now then is if I just run over some of the injuries and maybe so that people have a bit of an idea about the injuries and then you have got a gazillion, I don't know if you can see the questions, I don't think you can, you've no. got loads. So we need to leave mm -hmm. a, a whack of time at the end. We can do that. Um, so we, we can crack on with those. So injury wise, so if we go back to old uh, Jolly Skelly here, I hope Bamba's still happy with him. And I will try it. Now, this may fail. This may fail so badly. It's so blue, Peter. So, if they pop, my horse is going to need a vet. <laughs> so, essentially, this may, I, think I should have tried it first, shouldn't I? Oh, yeah, it kind of works, but kind of. Rhea Freeman will be laughing at me now because she texted me before and said, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm making lungs <laughs> out of the horse. Balloons. So I'll just do one, right? So essentially, I just wanted to show people how close the lung sits within the thorax. So if you can get through here, you've got a couple of um, layers of muscle, tiny muscle, the ones that you eat when you have spare ribs. So they're only skinny um, muscle, uh, between here. Um, and then you're right onto lung. So it just really demonstrates that if you fracture a rib like it's sharp ends when you prank something like this if you think about when you do the wishbone on a chicken or a turkey it's really sharp one end so when ribs fracture they're just so sharp and they will puncture the lung now that that causes what's called a pneumothorax and or a hemothorax so a pneumothorax let me just try and find my this may not work. If it if it works, like I'm a legend. But if I think it's, it's, it's entertainment either way. It's I think probably like the new medical teaching. So this is say like a lung. So everything in your body, you've just got to think is in is always in a carrier bag. That's the way I learned it. It's always sat in it in a carrier bag. It never just sits. So the lung, sorry, they're birthday balloons, but the lung would never just be sat in there. It's always got to be in like a double lining. So it has a lining. So if you put it into its bag and then it sits like there. So if I fracture it, I can't because it will pop it. But when this lining's on it, you, you would never really know. Now, there's a tiny bit of fluid between this and the actual lung, just so that the lung can move up and when you're when it's going up and down when you're breathing. So it can move without like getting stuck or grating on the inside of the chest wall. But two of the big thoracic injuries and life-threatening injuries are pneumothorax or hemothorax or a combination of the two. So pneumothorax is when you pop part of the lung. I'm not convinced this is gonna work. And then what happens, I'm gonna be so impressed if this works. Everyone's like with bated breath and it's gonna be just so like not that good. I'll be a failure, well done. So you end up with that in there. And you can see how much bigger that is now. 
So the lung partially collapses, but you've got all this air that's in the wrong place between the lining that should be flat. Now, if you've got a heart there, if you can see it, then that will push the heart over to the opposite side of the chest because you can't fit it in. This is rigid, so you can't fit it in because that's now like essentially doubled in size because the air's where it shouldn't be. Now, the result of that is immediate cardiac arrest. So there is absolutely nothing that you can do um, to relieve that unless you make a hole in the chest. We normally make it on the fifth, so one, two, three, four, five, about here to let, that, to let this air out so that this lung then goes back to the normal size and allows the heart to move back to its normal position. So that's a, a pneumothorax. And then the other thing you can get is obviously the lungs have loads of blood going to them because they um, are doing all the oxygenating and everything, aren't they? So the other thing that you can get, my Rivina. So if you think about this little wee fella here and then you get a bit of bleeding, and then you get a bit more bleeding. I really hope there's no holes in this. Then essentially, what you can end up with, oh, it's leaking slightly, is that. So you can fit probably almost all of your blood volume into one, hand, one side of your chest. And again, you're, it's leaking, isn't it? <laughs> again, I'm just going to move my leg. Um, but again, that, that causes you... Um, a massive problem. So that essentially is hemothorax and pneumothorax. Um, other things that loads of people will have had, let me just move him back, are oh, fractured ribs. And I get loads of messages about fractured ribs. It's a really common thing when somebody's had a fall. Um, as, as I touched on earlier, first rib I'm really, really worried about. A couple of fractured ribs, the rest of it, I, I'm not worried as long as there's no associated injuries. Um, but you, whoever's done it is really unhappy about it because it really, really, really hurts. Like not just a little bit, it hurts a lot. And it hurts every single time you breathe in, every time you breathe out. You can guarantee that you will suddenly become allergic to pollen or something and you'll need to cough constantly. It's horrific um, and incredibly painful. But there are slightly more serious injuries than just a normal fracture in that you can get what's called a flail segment. So if you fracture two or more ribs in two or more places, what happens is you get a section of rib that's moving independently to the rest of the body, uh, to the rest of the thorax. And so you, you can't breathe very well. And again, that is somebody that potentially from our perspective, we would probably take them to theater and fix the chest wall um, just so that it's not, it's all moving in time. Because if you've got one bit kind of seesawing and doing its own thing, it makes it incredibly difficult to breathe and apart from that it's very very painful so that's the kind of um, ribs obviously fractured collarbones not unusual again with a fall or coming down onto your arm um, ACJ joint here is this little joint here can you see that okay yeah um, but this is the end of the clavicle that's just clipping here onto the acromion which is a part of the scapula so part of um What's the normal name for scapula? What do you call it? This one. What do you call that one? I can never remember the normal names now. Um, I don't know, name of spot. Um, it'll come to me. Somebody will be shouting it out. I can't remember what we call them. Sh shoulder blades. Yeah. So <laughs> shoulder because you learn the medical ones and you're like, what is it really called? The shoulder blade. So this can come apart. Now, it doesn't tend to fracture when it comes apart from here, but you've got three really strong ligaments that kind of um, get it to um, stick down there, and then one that kind of wraps around a little bit. And then this prangs off the end, and then it ends up sticking up like that. So um, occasionally, and particularly in rugby, you can see, if you see a rugby player on the beach, it's not unusual to see them where they look like they've got wings, like bat wings. Um, so little lumps here, and that's normally because they've had ACJ joint dislocations from kind of something uh, like that in uh, rugby. Obviously, we've talked about the lung issues. You can have direct impact to the heart if you hit here on the sternum that can cause um, the same thing, really. It doesn't tend to be air around the heart, but certainly you can get, that could very easily be a demonstration of blood around the heart that would then press on the heart so that it couldn't 
it couldn't beat properly because it's being squished from the outside. So again, that's something that we'd need to intervene in very, very quickly to stop the patient um, dying. Um, let's just turn the little budget around. Um, you can fracture these. So you can fracture your scapula or your shoulder blades. Um, and that again shows us that there's been a lot of force involved for you to be fracturing things like that. Um, and then obviously this bit, which is what everybody tends to think about um, with a body protector, is everyone thinks about spines. Um, so you can break, I will show you on here because it makes a bit more sense. So there's a couple of breaks that we tend to see in equestrians. I'm actually going to use one of the lumbar, this is Martha's. I'm actually going to use one of her lumbar vertebrae just because it's a bit easier to show you. But so this is a human vertebrae. To get her the right way up. We'll use that one. Um, and as you can see, it's got a body. I don't know if it, is it, can you see it? Okay. It's a bit of a funny shape, but um, let me just turn it. It's seeing it the, the opposite way around, isn't it, on the screen? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that way. Is that way easier? Yeah, that way's easier. So you've got this part. Everything's opposite. Um, you've got this part, which is the body of the vertebrae. So if you can see from that way up, this is the body of the vertebrae. And then this part here is where the spinal cord is running. And then you've got these, which are your transverse processes, and these sticky outy bits, which are the bits you can feel down your back are your spinous processes. And then they all kind of sit nicely in a line like so so they all kind of click in quite nicely now you've got a natural curve of the spine at around t 10 11 so if you look at somebody side on they've kind of most people have got a curve that that way it's going to come out the opposite way isn't it on here but you're going to have the the inward curve on your neck and then a slight outward curve on the on the thorax and again there's just a slight inward curve which is um a dressage rider's nightmare because you're trying to push it out all the time um, on, on your lumbar spine, which is why we all get so much backache. Um, but yeah, so there are main fractures that I've seen from see from there is is that if you if you I don't want to wink her too hard, but if you do a extreme flexion extension, then you tend to get um, what's called um, a wedge fracture. So it squashes part of this body and it ends up with a wedge. Um, and then the other one that we see, and people talk about transverse fractures of the spine, they're not transverse fractures of the body. What they are is these little prongy bits that have been snapped off. Now, that can be okay and not be a big problem. It wouldn't be a, tend to be a problem down here, but I don't know if you can see at the side, uh, opposite side, don't you? There is where the spinal nerves for each segment come out. So if this breaking here is encroaching on the nerve that's coming out of there then that's a massive problem they don't tend to um so they don't tend to be that much of an issue um but these ones if these squash or become unstable quite often you'll have bits of bone that, that get pushed back into here and then that is in, encroaching immediately on the spinal cord so obviously that's the um, thoracic. Other thing that I see a lot of, and to be quite honest, after the opening up of lockdown, I've seen a lot of equestrian injury. I can't even believe how much I've seen. I'm, it's like, I see a, a fair whack, but not the amount I've seen. I've seen loads in the last couple of months. Mm. Liver lacerations, um, not uncommon. We talked about the fact that, um, probably easier on me actually talked about the fact that here you've got your liver here you've got your spleen and your kidneys um, and I've seen a pancreatic injury as well but again they are tucked underneath the thorax so you can damage them by breaking the rib and the rib going in and actually lacerating the um, liver the spleen or the kidneys or it can be from a direct force going directly onto the abdominal organs or as we talked about with the blood pipes, you can get these deceleration injuries. So if you think about when you see like a crash test tummy type thing and they kind of really violently fly forwards like this, don't they? We do still do the same when we come off um, and we have this really quick movements and anything that is tethered down 
within the abdomen or within the thorax can tear. Catastrophically, that could be the aorta where you're, you're done. You're not going to, you know, you, you will have a group that self-select and die immediately and don't get to hospital. And that's normally somebody that's torn their aorta to the point that it's just bled the whole blood volume out straight away. Um, but it can happen with um, sort of things within the tummy. So just the blood vessels that supply the bowel, um, part of the liver, part of the kidney, all these bits that are tethered down can cause quite subtle bleeding because normally if it's kind of gone like that and then gone back the weight of it is sat back against where it's torn so we have to be very careful from our perspective that we certainly don't miss anything like that because i think from my perspective which is why i keep batting on about their question injury most people that ride are pretty fit you know e even if they're a bit gnarly because they've ridden for a long time we're all pretty fit so you compensate for an incredibly long time before you show anything, which is why you, you need to be able to describe your mechanisms well so that we suspect stuff. Because if you've torn and then it's flopped back to where it should be, which is causing essentially direct pressure on it, that's fine because you're just very, very slowly oozing rather than spurting within your abdomen. You might not become unwell, for 24, 48, 72 hours, and then become extremely unwell very, very quickly. So, um, yeah, that's kind of one of my uh, one of my nightmares. How, so, how do you pick up those slow those slow bleeds? Slow bleeders. So, suspicion normally it's having a high index of suspicion on mechanism, which is why I keep banging. So you're bang reliant on people. We're reliant on the story, yeah, mm. and, and and people understanding what a question injury can do because i think you know from our perspective most doctors don't ride they haven't got a clue it's not like it's on every saturday like the football where they go oh, okay or rugby yeah you know um so you just have to have this really high index of suspicion and if the fall is described properly it would normally prompt a trauma call so that's normally a ct top to toe if indicated and and we can ct based on just how it's happened so the likelihood of my, like our suspicion of, is there likely to be an injury? So I always say that the horse riders are the same as, um, exactly the same as, as you being um, on a motorbike and being thrown off a motorbike. From yeah. my perspective, it's exactly the same. Um, but but you do know, people tend to sort of downplay it and, or normalize, yeah, normalize going off? You know, and, and it's not unusual to see late presentations for equestrians as well. You know, I've seen people that have rocked. I've seen someone that's driven themselves with a pelvic injury, drove themselves after mucking out, after coming off, putting the horse away, washing yeah. the horse off, obviously, because it couldn't possibly not be washed off, fed, <laughs> rocked, mucked out, children fed, put to bed, birthed. Oh, yeah, that is a bit sore. I think I'll drive to hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, you know, and the, and the first question is always, when can I ride? Not for a while, because you're going to the, at the time I was working in a peripheral hospital, you know, you're going to the major trauma center to have your pelvis fixed. So not for quite a long time, my darling. Yeah. yeah. So it's just that we are a nightmare. So anything that can help us um, keep safe is amazing. Hmm. So out of all those things, from my perspective, a body protector will provide some degree of protection. Is I, I'm, I'm sure you would agree, but from my yeah. perspective as doctor, I, I always ask whether somebody's had a body protector on. Yeah, well, we certainly, you know, we certainly can't prevent a lot of that, but hopefully, what we can do is reduce the severity, or, or hopefully, save some of the lesser, lesser ones. Um, I think there's certainly like a lot of it is anecdotal at the moment, isn't it? And I think, yeah. um, you know, we're going to be working all together all the manufacturers and vita together aren't we to be actually collecting the equestrian data so that we can see um what sort of injuries we're, we're seeing um at the moment but yeah. um certainly without doubt there are it, if somebody has not had a body protector on i mean i i know that there are life-threatening injuries that i would have seen that wouldn't have been life-threatening mm. it would have been severe and a problem mm but they wouldn't have got my heart rate up. Whereas yeah. if they haven't had one on, then they're in the territory of life-threatening, life-changing injuries instead of being 
severe injuries. You know, yeah. there's always going to be there's always going to be a section of people that are still horrifically injured with a mm. body protector on. Yeah. But from my perspective, I would say that 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 cohort of pe- person that gets to hospital that has significant life changing injuries would not have made it to hospital without a body protector on. They wouldn't have got there. Well, so, you know, we are massive advocates um, of everything that you guys are doing to keep people safe. Hugely. Well, so I think you know, I think it's I think it's a great initiative. Um, if we can, you know, collect some formal data and, and, and analyze it properly, because just say we we know how they perform in a, a laboratory and you know energy transfer or, and things. And, and yes, you hear lots of it, and it's those sort of stories of um, you know people who think think they've um, helped them. Um, but yeah, if we can actually correlate that to to actual sort of um, injury reports and things like that. I think that's I think that's that's so valuable. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of where we're going. And like before, I let them let all these a gazillion, gazillion questions to you. Where do you think the future of it is going? What? Where do you think we're going to go? Do you think we're going to end up where you like with a hat? You have to have it on for everything, or you know, is there anything coming that you think? Or where do I we think, need to go? I think, there's a, I think there's a way to go both on the product development side, but also on sort of the attitudes towards them. I think on both, and they, but they're both. Uh, link really you know i think we can still go away between making them more protective offering more um you know high level safety um but also in terms of, of comfort and, and weight and, and and things like that which all make them more appealing to wear and as sort of we said you know there is the generation growing up now are, are used to wearing them you know and i think are far more open to wearing them more of the time um you know an older generation probably only a lot of the time, more the way they have to, you know, whether that was stipulated by rules or, you know, competing or in a yard, they have to. Um, so, I th- you know, I think that, that that goes in hand in hand. Yet, yeah, from our point of view, we have to make a better, you know, better and better products, which I think we've come a long way in. Oh, um, huge, huge, yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've got to make them more appealing to wear. Um, you know, and I think people like Beta are, uh, and, and yourself are, are educating people on, the benefits of them uh, which i think is, is another sort of big factor from people's attitudes towards them yeah. um so yeah you know i, I will will people have to wear them um i mean if you look at racing most most people have to wear them in the yards yeah. uh, for exercising and, and and in the yard so uh mainly you know from an insurance point of view um so they're used to wearing them they wear them day in day out um you know and nobody moans as much as them so you know if you can get them <laughs> wearing, well, we don't um, mind as long as they give us some tips though hey eh? yeah you know but you get all the best racing tips yeah you know but it, it's i you know there's always going to be an element of personal choice you know but i think if we can make them easier and better to wear um i think that that can only help that and the more educated people are um i think also the better I think genuinely, like everybody that I've seen, have been like, "Why did I not have it on?" Like it was hung in the tack room. Like, why did I not have it on? You know. Yeah, and, you know, and the man we've 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 sold it. You know, speak to people at shows that there, there's an awful lot of people buying them after the event. You know. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. really, they're lucky that they're in a position where they can, that they're not in serious trouble yeah. because they've had enough of a scare to actually mm. then go and and buy a a body protector but then we'll do stupid things like we'll say oh well i'll wear it on that horse but i won't wear it on that horse yeah I, you know anybody that rides all your horses like everybody that rides you know they are inherent risk takers you know that is just i suppose part of the appeal yeah um for, for lots of people so yes there is an element of that but yeah. you know it's um but then like you say the generation that's coming through now it's normal yeah. for all of them to wear a body protector to put their body protector and the hat on so actually yeah. it may be as you go forward as they come through that actually it's it's more unusual not to wear one it's like when smoking was cool wasn't it everyone smoked yeah, it was, like yeah. now it's rare that you meet anyone that smokes yeah. So and yeah you know yeah. Switch. i think everybody everybody's used to wearing them for cross country and um you know kids showed i mean things like that to a certain extent but yeah. you know, as i suppose a lot of the accents you see is that actually 
uh, almost probably the majority of accidents don't happen in those those circumstances you know it, it's it's getting on in the yard it's it's hacking on the road it, it's there a lot of the time where you, where you see the really nasty ones you know um, yeah, taking holes to the field gates you know right. and they're they're probably the you know they're there all the times where you haven't got to wear about it yet. so i think so it's targeting those sorts of people in those sort of circumstances to make them you know more appealing and um you know try and try and protect people more of the time yeah possibly right i'm gonna let these questions loose on you you ready like, absolutely deep breath and all of that um <laughs> hold on let me go here so i've got some of the dodgy slightly people uh ria says body protectors protect a lot more than you think don't they indeed they do um ray has just fractured her t6 yep didn't have it on because she was just schooling mm. yeah um a bit of a theme i think uh vivian says do you have to update body protectors like hats well no as i said we, we you know we, we recommend they're replaced every three to five years um and that sort of depends on how hard how hard they use really but as i say i mean the foam will start to degrade after a certain gradually to after a certain period you know and then if they won't have sort of the impact performance that they're that they're meant to um so so yes you know we're, we're aware that people do keep them longer but you know these sort of handing it down between generations is 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 not a great idea you know and when you do get a not a very old one back you it's remarkable how you know it, it has hard and it has brittled. You know, it won't be giving you the, the protection. You know, we want it to, and you want it to. No, okay. Um, Emma says she loves her race safe body protector and would wouldn't ever be without it when out eventing. Um, Emma's first one was an unflattering one that unflattering strap between her legs, which was not a good look. And thank yeah, we'll God, be in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, Kerry says her race safe is so comfortable. Sue says she loves her race safe. Um, Debbie says her first one had that horrible strap between her legs. The second one held my arms out as it was so stiff, but I love my race safe body protector as it doesn't give you any restrictions when riding, unlike the old fashioned ones. So that's, that's good feedback. Um, Kate says, can you explain why you should wear a body protector and an air jacket, or is it sufficient to just wear one or the other? I often just wear my air jacket unless I'm cross country. Should I be doing both? I'd like to know your thoughts. Yeah, I think that's quite a good point, really. Um, I think the way we try to explain it is air jacket should be seen as sort of an, an extra layer of protection. Um, yeah. you know, they're not a replacement for a body protector. Um, they, air jackets work very well with certain types of impacts um mainly sort of falling onto a flat ground you know or, or, as long as that sort of impacts dispersed over quite a wide area um you know which they work well where they don't work very well at all or, or offer very little um protection is is where that impacts more localized you know that that's everything from falling off onto something to being kicked or you know coming off in the in the, the saddle you know um hitting you you know so in which that 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 localized impact will go straight through that sort of level that um layer of air protection so um together worn together they work very well um we would discourage them and i you know i think most it's most people if you ask them would discourage them being worn on their own if it's a case of wearing nothing or an air jacket there's probably an argument to say it's better than nothing um but but there's also so there's that side there's also the fact that what body is definitely sort of static level of protection it's always going to be there air jackets yeah. are reliant on being triggered you know and as i think and they don't always go off to no you know if you have a horrible one so. and the horse comes down with you it, it's not guaranteed you know yes they are very reliable in terms of triggering these days but depending on the, the type of fall you 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 do have to be thrown um so you know yes better than nothing if you're hacking out but it's not a substitute they work best together i would i think we always recommend if people are coming to the riding fresh you buy a body sector first right. yeah and then absolutely. if you want an extra layer of protection you know you absolutely look at an air jacket yeah but i think i heard it because obviously did the um beta safety course today 
Yeah. I heard somebody, um, one of the speakers there had said that it's like your body protector is your seatbelt in a car. Now, if your car's got airbags, that's a winner. But yeah. if your car had airbags, you wouldn't drive without your seatbelt off. Yeah. Like, and I think that good. kind of yeah. sums, sums it up really. Like you want your airbag, but you not you don't drive without your seatbelt. Yeah, on. it's it's an extra layer of protection. You know, it, it's yeah. it's an additional. Um, Claire says, <laughs> "Don't go red." Um, I love my race safe, but having big boobs and a short body, <laughs> it's quite restrictive under my arms. Is there an answer? Well, I know a good surgeon, but, but <laughs> I don't know, James. Is there an answer? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think one of the personally, I think one of the, the best things we've done in in, in developing the process over the last probably it's only the last couple of years is offering so many more size variations. Okay, you know, every size has uh, two body lengths, four, and then four back lengths for each of those two body lengths. You know, there are so many size variations now. Um, Yes, that you historically that she was probably one of the customers that was quite hard to fit, but um, you know we, we've now shaped them more to be quite sort of female friendly and things like that. So I would suggest go and getting making sure it fits you properly. Yeah. Um, if not, go and you know see a see a stockist um, to get you fitted, or, or or speak to us or another brand and um, check it's fitting properly because it shouldn't yeah. be an issue. You know, there are so many things we can do these days. Yeah. Definitely. And I don't know how old your um, body protector is, Claire, but you may be due an upgrade. Can you ever, just a question, if somebody ever wanted one that was made bespokely, can they contact you for that if they specifically yeah. wanted that? Abs yeah, absolutely. So um, we've added loads of variations within the size range. So we don't do as many made measures as we used to because of that. But there are still, yeah, we still do. That's one of the beauty sure, of making sure them all here. Okay. We can tweak them. We can we can make we can fit ninety nine point nine 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 percent. Oh, you, you'll be able to fit. You'll be able. To, I know, Claire. You'll be able to fit her. Um, so, oh, Vivian says you sound like a lovely company to work with. That's nice. Um, Kate says she currently has a rotator cuff injury to the shoulder. Um, can the pads help with this? And can you purchase them individually? So, I would say yes. They yes, they would have helped with the rotator cuff. Can you purchase them individually? Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, they're sold separately. The shoulder pads, um, they they attach onto any any of our models. Um, they're absolutely something we 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 want to try and push. Um, and I think that's the same for all body tech to brands. We we all sort of between us think we don't sell as many shoulder pads as we should compared yeah. to the number of body techs as we do. You know, and I think yes, we've 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 gone to that um, effort to protect um, thoracic, but you know, your shoulders are very vulnerable. Um, oh, yeah, huge. And there's not very many riders who get to a certain age who don't have shoulder problems after, you yeah. know, after a, a career of fools. You know, they are, that's how you tend to come off. Um, and, you know, so yes, you know, I see, yes, they are an extra expense on t once you bought a body sector, but, you know, they did a, it's a while ago now, but they did do a, a, um, a study of, of eventing falls and there was an 80 percent reduction in um in shoulder injuries for, for those people shoulder pads. yeah it, it, I, yeah it's something we 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 should be doing more to try and promote um and please please try you know and but i think again that they, they have come on so far they used to be big awful like, bins, dynasty, you know. like dynasty ones yeah Not now. now you know you wouldn't know once you get used to you know one a couple of times you wouldn't know you're wearing them so um yeah please try some Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, Tamara says, um, lots of people have said that air jackets can contribute to neck injuries. Is this true? And can you wear an air jacket alone? I think we've kind of, we've answered the air jacket alone. I am not aware that there's any evidence um, that they contribute to neck injury. No, all. again, That's I think it's, it's a bit. It's not been done, is it? Uh, so, yeah. Um, they, come in in, they come in and out of fashion a bit as and when people, you know, how people think they 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 help or not, but um, I think on the whole they've been very they've been beneficial on the whole. Yeah, um, Vivian says I purchased a body protector twenty years ago as it matched my cross country colours. It was so uncomfortable I sold it eventually. Sounds like the new ones are so much better. Hundred percent they are, even down to 
I'm trying to think when I bought my one before this was probably about eight years before. Huge difference, massive difference. Yeah. Even now, when I see what's out now, it's like, oh, okay. And I'm probably due an upgrade soon. So I'm quite excited about that. Um, we've covered the stuff on air jackets. Um, Helen says, utterly fascinating. Thank you for taking the time to do this talk. I need a new body protector and love that Race Safe, our UK based family business. Hoping to see you at Blair Horse Trials to get measured for a new one. Are you at Blair then? Fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, you know, if it's all on and. On when and is that? Uh, it's after it's Burley, been. so September. Oh, Actually, okay. Burley's not running. Um, oh. I haven't heard more about Blair. I hope I hope so. You know, yeah, we need I our might season under. Um, Ray says this is um this is why I need something comfy enough to school every day. I have a Pro Two air jacket, but keep forgetting to unhitch before getting off. Every day schooling, that's a pain. Yeah, that's huge. Because you end up causing an injury, isn't it? That's what I found with mine. If you forget to... Yeah, I mean, yeah, you used to, when you when they first sort of came out... You, you know, you've go, done it as soon as you've swung your leg over you, as well. Yeah, you you, you'd, go to, like, oh. um, you'd go to an event and there'd just be sort of a series across the field of pop, people pop, jumping pop, off, pop. you know, pop, you know. But yeah. to get to habit, um, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what's the best way to get fitted for a body protector? There seems to be lots of different schools of thought in respect of length. If it's too long, it catches the saddle, but if it's too short, it doesn't protect your organs. So, yeah, I think what fits, is yeah. the kind of length that you would say is? Yeah, I think probably fits quite something we, we could have touched on. But um, yeah, I think she's probably like referring to back length mainly. Um, yeah. Historically, they, there was a tendency to fit them too long. You know, they used to be called back protectors. They used to be sort of this misconception that they should be sort of designed to cover your coccyx and protect your coccyx. But um, the reality of the situation is you can't sit in a saddle and ride <laughs> with yeah. something that's designed to cover your coccyx. So they're not, you know, I think the way we tend to fit them is you want enough clear. It's a balance. You want good blood protection, but you want enough clearance of your saddle. Beta, the way beta train and the way we sort of suggest is if you sit in the saddle, if you've got sort of a hand's width between the bottom of your body to etch from the seat of the saddle, it's quite a good guide and you're going to have enough clearance for a full, you know, a full range of movement. Um, but, you know, balance that with some, some good lower back protection. Okay, that's grand. Um, hold on. You've got, you've got loads. Um, so that's the T. So there's uh, everybody knew what a uh, scapula was called, the shoulder blade. I can't. There's two names for bloody. Yeah, everything. I'm a bit embarrassed. Bit embarrassed by that. Um, so Ray is there with her T6 fracture blesser. Sue says, "Could you help raise awareness of equestrian injuries amongst alien medics? Do you think, Dr. Fisher? Um, I am. I am currently um, Sue, and yeah, it is massively. So that's kind of why I." ended up starting the page because initially obviously all the juniors that have ever worked with me get hammered on equestrian stuff all the time um i'm in the process of writing a module for the royal college of emergency medicine so that that will be available to teach sort of the juniors coming in about equestrian injury so hopefully you know they'll be recommended to do that um alongside the manufacturers that have been supporting the clinics we we're look, starting to look at injury as well so if we can publish some research again that gets it out into the into the medical world um a, a bit more but i kind of went with the the attack of if i can teach you guys to understand your mechanisms and when to go and explain them correctly then you will trigger somebody's teaching and you will trigger the doctor to think oh christ this is a problem like you know the mechanism's huge they need to be dealt with as proper trauma so we're kind of doing a bit of a two-pronged attack, but absolutely we are going to. Um, Sue's saying again about air jackets, about some research shows a worse rate of injuries when wearing one. What's your opinion on them? I think the jury's out. I don't think we, I don't think we know. And, I, you know, hands up, I haven't read up on any um, anything to do with air jackets. So um, I, I will look at it from and speak to Beta about it, but I, I don't, I don't know. So I think we'll, um, we'll leave that unless you know anything, James. I don't. No, I say, so, I think that nothing. I think it's all a bit anecdotal myself. Absolutely, but, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, and, you know, there's so, lots of benefits to them, but I think it is. Um, there's nothing strong at the moment, is there? No. And Kate says, why can't personal rider insurance be reduced if you wear a body protector that might incentivize more compliance? Yeah, very, 
I don't, uh, do you know anyone? I don't, we could, it's a good idea. But... No, yeah, it's a legit point. You know, that's why, you know, the racing yards have to base, you know, they're all, oh, right, yeah. um, that's, you know, that's part of their insurance, you know, is, is their all staff are all wearing level three, um, borrow detectors. So, yeah, I th it's, it's, it's a good point. Yeah. Um, amazing chat again tonight. Protectors truly save lives. Where can we look for the protectors? Find it harder for a smaller waist and large front. So Sarah, like um, like James has said, like this, if you're going for a new body protector, there's a, a multitude of sizes now in four. Big boobs, little boobs, like everything. It's all covered now. Um, but if you really were struggling because you're just particular shape, it can be an option to have a bespoke one made. You just need to contact the company. Yeah, speak um, to, you know, we can we can put you in touch with somebody nearby who's probably a bit of a specialist in that sort of thing. Because it might just be that they're, fit, that they're not being fitted correctly. That mm. that's probably more more like, isn't it? Mm. Um, Samara says she wishes there were more show jacket compatible ones. I think you can put it underneath your. It, it, it's like, so that's a question for me. It, like, if you have got one on and you're wearing your show jacket, are they supposed to be on under or over? Or doesn't it matter? Uh, I guess again, that's a bit of an age old, age old question, really. Technically, they're going to work best when they're sort of in close contact with you. You know, so, so under. Well, that's how they're technically going to perform best. But actually, if you're wearing it underneath, but you can hardly do your jacket up, and you you're restricted you can't move properly you're more likely to fall off aren't is you? that going to be a bigger you know are you actually in that circumstance actually just better off putting it over um and being a much more sort of confident rider yeah uh, realistic in the real world most people wear them over the top um yeah, yeah you know but yeah it's, it's i suppose you know there's there's a whole new product line of sort of air jackets built into show jackets and things like that um you see a bit in sort of show jumping certainly in europe um so that's that's perhaps something that's going to become more popular but um yeah yeah um sharon says she works at events as a first responder um this is great you're describing it so well regarding the mechanisms of injury there's never enough room on the pro forma to write enough information to hand over how do you prioritize the best information to give um so I'm assuming the pro forma, um, if you're talking about British eventing, they've got, or the FEI do have a standard document that they use. Um, I, if you're finding that it's not suitable for, if it's not, you know, 100% fit for purpose, you can always write on the back. But to be honest, contact them and, and tell them that you need more room on your form. It's not a problem. They're, if you're covering the events, they're very good at receiving feedback. That's what I would do. Um, Priority-wise, it's the best thing to do is to use a kind of ABC um, handover. So just a standard um, handover and just obviously get your worst um, injuries in first. But you need um, it's an at mist essentially, um, which is a bit too much detail for in here. But if that is useful to you, Sharon, just contact me off here and I will send you the details for the at mist handover. Um, Ray says, what's the difference between a Provent and an RS20110? I don't know what that is. Just different models we make, both okay. for level three. Sorry. I know the Provent. Yeah, both, that's Provent's our latest. Both will give you the same level of level three protection. Um, RS20 is sort of, a, a, sort of a, a satin finish, satin outer, which is sort of quite smart, quite popular with particularly sort of kids and show jackets and things like that. Um, Provence our latest one, which is a bit, bit lighter, a bit more breathable. Okay. Um, no, I've not seen these near me. Are they ready, readily available? Yeah, you are in pretty much most shops, aren't you? If, the pack shops. Or is there a yep. list on your website where you yeah. are? Yeah, there's list stockists um, on our website. We're widely available in the UK um, and in Europe and, and, and further afield. It's been a, it's obviously been a bit tricky last 12 months. Um, stores haven't really been able to do, well, haven't, 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 haven't been able to do fittings. So I think most of them are back up and running now. Um, I'd, I'd call them before you go to double check, but most- I think they're still are. doing appointments, aren't they? Even for like boots, body protected stuff, they're still doing an yeah, appointment. Yeah, lots, yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think, or you know, worst case, if there's nobody new, call us, speak to us, we'll we'll point you in the right direction. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so Emma's definitely going to replace hers. Fabulous. Um, 
Vivian says, brilliant talk, fractured two vertebrae in my back years ago, only went to the hospital when the pain was so bad I couldn't sit down or bend. Well, you're a true equestrian, and I'm not going to tell you you're clever because you're not. That's naughty. Um, Sean says, what's the best way to clean them? They get smelly when you wear them a lot. What is the best way? I mean, obviously, um, wash soap machine, and water, but... you know, sponge, soap and water, um, hang them up to dry. Um, so don't get them proper wet then? Or yeah, you can do. Yeah, the bath, fine. Like, or... As long as it's sort of a mild detergent or soap, Warm, warm water you, you're okay. fine um you know they're closed cell foams they won't absorb foam uh, oh. uh, water um it, it's, it's one of those things they're they're safety products so um we can't recommend they're washed in more intensive ways just because of the way they'd have to be tested but they're pretty durable um, anything, Ria's just saying, not too hot though, question mark. Is there a heat? Like if someone puts them in, would you say just like tepid water or? Yeah, warm water, you're fine. Yeah, you know, don't don't boil them. But <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? They'll be like, yeah. you told us on that line. Yeah, yeah, I should probably Milton. <laughs> keep quick quiet. But yeah, no warm water, you're absolutely oh, fine. Okay, so just warm water. So that that's grand. So that's the end of your grilling by our <laughs> wonderful viewers. Um, but I just, I think... From my perspective, the biggest thing is, is, and you know, I'm as guilty as the rest of us for not always, you know, wearing one around the horses and everything else. It's about balancing risk, isn't it? And about just, you know, doing everything you can. And I think definitely after COVID, I think people are taking a lot more responsibility for themselves. And it's about, yeah. you know, limiting any potential damage to yourself because the effect of that, you know, the life-changing stuff is um or ending is obviously devastating for either you or um the rest of your yeah. um family um but a massive thank you james for coming on it's been really really interesting and so no, useful I think it's been interesting too um to uh you know know a bit more and, and understand how much work actually goes into this stuff because you don't you know you don't do it like just for fun do you and it's grand that we've got you know, UK family brands that are running and successful because then we can like support our own as well. So that's that's really, really, really good. Um, I think that's us, isn't it? I don't think, I think is everyone done with their, um, oh yeah, everyone's um, saying thanks a mill and good awareness, especially about the shoulders. Where, where would, because I don't have shoulder ones for mine, actually. Where do you get the shoulder ones? Is that directly from you, or can you get it from... Hang on, George, for us. Um, they're also, most of our stockists will sell them. So you can just go into the way you get your... Yeah, they're one of those things. They're, they're only available in three sizes. So much. It's not as so you have to go for a fitting for them. So you can oh, go on okay. the stockist so website. Okay, um, yeah, perfect. And so, from my perspective, please do those, because there's nothing hmm. worse than having shoulder injuries if you want to carry on riding. It's a nightmare. It's an yeah. absolute nightmare. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so thank you so much. Thanks very much for supporting again, guys. Right, Don't thank forget, you. this is this amazing giveaway that um, James has donated um, to the clinic so that you can win um, a ProVent, which is the, um, race, um, the race safe body protector that I use with a cover of your choice as well. So you're going to look super smart um, out on your horses um, this summer. We're going to draw that. Um, I can't remember what date I put on. I think it's in a, in a couple of days. Um, we'll do the random generator between Facebook and Instagram. But just make sure you're following Race Safe and all the King's Horses because we will check. Um, and then it will be me that contacts you. So, um, yeah, you don't fall foul of any spam. But thank you a million and I will catch up with you all soon um, in a month for the next Ride Clinic. Thanks, Emil. Thank you.